100 people with the biggest egos and the sharpest elbows in America. That's the description of the United States Senate by our guest today, who as minority leader is responsible for managing a lot of those egos and elbows. Mitch McConnell, Uncommon Knowledge, now. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge in the Strom Thurmond Room of the United States Capitol. I'm Peter Robinson. By the way, at some point during this interview, you may hear some beeping in the background. That would be a call to the Senate floor for a quorum vote. The senior senator from Kentucky, Addison Mitchell McConnell Jr., first came to the Senate as an intern some four and a half decades ago. He won election to the Senate in his own right in 1984, and since 2006, he has served as minority leader. Senator McConnell, thanks for joining us. Peter, glad to be with you. According to the New York Times, two weeks before the inauguration of President Obama, quote, Senate Republicans gathered beaten and dispirited at the Library of Congress. They had lost seven seats in November, and they were about to go up against an extraordinarily popular new president. We came in shell-shocked, said Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina, your colleague. Mitch, you, Mitch McConnell, Mitch came up with a game plan to make us relevant with just 40 members, close quote. Senator, what was the game plan? Well, once it was clear <clears throat> the president was gonna try to turn us into a Western European country as rapidly as he could, about the only strategy you have left when, you're, when your opposition has a 40 seat majority in the House, and when they fit, quit counting in Minnesota, they had 60 in the Senate. And as your viewers may already know, but I'll repeat, 60 gives you real control of the Senate. 51 gives you a majority, but 60 gives you control because so many things we do require 60. When they quit counting votes in Minnesota, they had 60 in the Senate. The president was sitting on a 65% approval rating. In fact, they could do whatever they wanted to. And it became clear, I think, that uh, Rahm Emanuel, <clears throat> the mayor of Chicago, then the chief of staff, put it this way. He said, um, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. So what he meant was they were going to try to turn us into a Western European country, as I mentioned earlier, as rapidly as possible. We knew we couldn't stop the agenda, but we thought we had a chance of creating a national debate about whether all of this excess was appropriate. And the key to having a debate, frankly and candidly, was to deny the president, if possible, the opportunity to have any of these things be considered bipartisan. Because to the extent that you can characterize an issue as bipartisan, it immediately um, it conveys that it must be okay because both sides have agreed to it. I give the credit, uh, to some extent, I give at least the, the president an assist for picking an agenda that made it possible for us to unify an opposition to it because it was such the wrong thing to do for the country. If you sum it all up, it ran up over the period of his <clears throat> service. We've increased the national debt 43%, passed an almost trillion dollar stimulus bill that did not stimulate, uh, taken over our health care, taken over the student loan business, basically nationalized the student loan right. business, People over at the Federal Communications Commission trying to take over the internet. People over at the National Labor Relations Board trying to get rid of the secret ballot in labor union elections and telling companies where they can move inside America. In, in short, a massive government excess. And so what my strategy was, was to try to convince my members that this was not the sort of thing that deserved bipartisan support, that we needed to have a national debate about the future of the country. The New York Times again. <clears throat> on Obamacare, or the, formally speaking, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, quote, by the time the health bill was approved by the Senate on Christmas Eve 2009 with zero Republican votes, Democrats had been forced to cut questionable intra-party deals and jump through legislative hoops, this is in the New York Times, in an ugly process that helped sour the public on the party and its legislation, close quote. Zero Republican votes. Now, I am sure that some large portion of the negotiations and discussion that takes place in the Republican conference must remain confidential. 
but to the extent that you can help laymen to understand the workings of this institution. How did you do that, Senator? How did well, you keep I, you know, you, zero I, I, Republican I wouldn't vote? give myself all the credit here. I, I want to give some of the credit to the Democrats. It was such an incredible <laughs> overreach. I mean, basically what I was trying to convince my members of is this is the kind of thing that does not deserve bipartisan support. If we allow this administration, if we can avoid it, <clears throat> to take over you know, one-sixth of our economy, the single biggest step we could take in the wrong direction to Europeanize the country, uh, that would be a huge mistake. And so I think by holding all of our people together, they had no margin for error. And that's what that quote is talking about. By the time we had that vote on Christmas Eve, Obamacare was very unpopular. They were having a hard time selling it to their own members. They had President Clinton come up and talk to them. The president was up talking to them. The vice president was up talking to them. It's going to be popular. It'll be okay. Vote for it. You had one senator who held out for a special deal for his state. It became known as the Cornhusker kickback. Right. Another senator who held out for a special deal for her state. It became known as the Louisiana Purchase. In other words, by not allowing them to have any Republican cover, they had to sell this incredibly unpopular bill to their own members, and they engaged in the kind of unseemly tactics that, so, that, further, that further made the bill. But, you know, the bill was unpopular both ways, both in terms of the process of passing, right. but also what it did. Again, I, if I'm trying to go someplace where you can't go for reasons of confidentiality, but you have some members from the Northeast, mm -hmm. and particularly in the first 18 months of, this administ of the Obama administration, Republican support for the patient, uh, for Obamacare, or earlier for the economic stimulus, you had to have members saying, Senator, you've got to let us go. We, yeah. we cannot be the party of no. Yeah. How do you answer that? Well. <laughs> It went on for months, and you're right. The, the president was phone banking a number of my members, uh, holding out the prospect of signing ceremonies and all the rest. And we had endless discussions, lots of conferences, uh, back and forth and back and forth um, about, but in the end, Peter, I think if I had any success at all, and I would not give myself credit for all this, it was talking about what they were trying to do to the country and whether or not we were comfortable with that and whether or not that deserved a patina of bipartisanship. And if they had been able to pick off a single Republican, they would have claimed it was a bipartisan accomplishment. And so I think the credit really goes to my members. I think they, they responded, I think, to the genuine threat that we all felt this was uh, to the country that we all love and, and want to preserve. Election Day 2010, Senate Republicans pick up a net gain of six seats, the biggest, the best result since 1994. Vindication? I think so. I think the American people responded to all of this excess <clears throat> by issuing what one pundit here in Washington called a national restraining order. Stop it. And the American people restored uh, divided government, something they have been comfortable with most of the time since World War II. In fact, we've had divided government more often than not. And I think the American people wanted it to stop. Even though we didn't take the Senate, we ended up with 47 in a body that requires 60, which meant that we were no longer irrelevant and able to, to be a major player here. The Senate does not function easily, and the only way you can really reduce it to your control is when you have 60 votes. And on Obamacare, it was hard for them to get their own people in line right. because they had none of us. Right. All right. So you get up to 47 as a result of the 2010 election, case study of the way governance changes. During the debt ceiling controversy last summer, you proposed, to be perfectly frank, Senator, I tried to understand, but I didn't quite get the, me you proposed, can you briefly remind us of the measure you proposed, where the president, could, the, the debt ceiling would rise, but Congress wouldn't have to give its assent. How did that? Well, our, our you know, my, my view was, it, <clears throat> if the president wanted to ask for the debt ceiling, he ought to have full responsibility for it. Right. So we set up a mechanism that gave him the ability to ask us to raise the debt ceiling, after which we could introduce a resolution of disapproval, which he could veto, right. and the veto could be sustained by a third. 
In other words, we knew <clears throat> that it would be irresponsible to let America default for the first time in history. On the other hand, the president who had run the debt up, <clears throat> now some 43%, deserved, in my view, to own uh, the issue to, to the extent that that was um, something uh, appropriate, and I thought it was under the circumstances. Right. But we did more than that. Yeah. Even though the deal was much maligned. That's, I, I want we, to get to that in a moment. Go yeah, ahead. yeah. We, we did <clears throat> not nearly as much as I had hoped, but we agreed to $2.1 trillion in spending reductions on the, in the discretionary part of the budget, which regretfully now is only 40% of what we spend every year. Right. We only vote on 40% of what we spend. All the rest of it is interest on the, on the national debt. And entitlements, and the reason we use the term entitlement is because you get it whether we got the money to pay it or not. And these are very popular things like Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Um, we didn't raise taxes, and we got discretionary spending uh, reduced, not nearly as much as we would have done with a different president and a different Senate, but they were unable to raise taxes. So uh, on that deal, yeah. you said even though the deal was much maligned, mm. and it was, I can recall hearing Rush Limbaugh maligned the deal. Mm -hmm. Speaker Boehner had to adjust his own proposals a couple of times. He was under pressure from his new Tea Party members. 66 Republicans in the House and 19 of your own members here in the Senate voted against the final compromise. And so there is an argument to be made, Senator, that more than any other Republican, you laid the predicate for the rise of the Tea Party. You held your conference together and said no to Obamacare, we will stand against this. Mm -hmm. And across the country, people responded. Mm -hmm. And then within a few months, they were on your back. So, uh, but, you know, <clears throat> members of the Tea Party understand the Constitution. And the Constitution says you have a House, you have a Senate, and you have a President. And we control only the House. And so you've got a, you're left with a choice. Do you want to be completely dysfunctional and do nothing? Or do you have to, in the end, compromise with those who control two-thirds of the government? And so my view was it's irresponsible to the country and to the future to be dysfunctional. And so we did the best we could, given the fact that we controlled only the House of Representatives. We didn't raise taxes, and we got $2.1 trillion in spending reductions. My view is that's better than nothing. Here's what I don't sense in you. I don't sense even an impulse to say, Oh, those yahoos in the Tea Party, if only they understood what, what the way you have to, you're, you're not like, you're, you're actually grateful to them even when they're on your back. Well, without, Is that right? Without, Is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. Without that energy and enthusiasm, we wouldn't have been in the position to do as well as we did. And even though a lot of people were disappointed, I was disappointed. Given a choice between cutting $2.1 trillion and doing nothing, I choose cutting the $2.1 trillion. Now, a lot of people wanted to do more. And my re reaction to that is, help us take the Senate, help us elect a new president, and we'll have the votes to do more. Because we all learned in the first grade that only those who win elections get to make policy. The people who don't win don't get to make policy. Uh, the man from Louisville. Senator, as best, uh, just Googling around, in Kentucky, between 1929 and 2003, the Republicans got the governorship once. You grew up, you grew up in Alabama to the age of 13, as I recall, then you moved to Kentucky. What's also very clear from your biography is that you loved politics from the get-go. <laughs> now, what on earth was a man who loved politics from the teenage years doing, associating himself in those years with the Republican Party? in a border state. I decided to do it the hard way. <laughs> well, you certainly did. But what's, where, where, uh, how did this happen? Oh, you know, my dad fought in World War II as a foot soldier under Eisenhower. And I, I recall, even though we lived in the deep south then where there were literally no Republicans, he voted for Eisenhower. And in fact, one of those, <clears throat> back in my era, and it may still be true today, they do these little mug shots every year of, your, of you, you know, when you're in first grade, second grade, third grade. My fifth grade uh, picture, my school mugshot from fifth grade, had an I like Ike button really? on it. Really? So I think I may have had some inclination in the Republican direction as a result of my father's politics. 
but certainly it wasn't an advantage to be a Republican in Kentucky in those days. Kentucky's gotten kind of red now, and I think generally, certainly in federal elections, is more inclined in our direction. It was not that way when I first started running. Um, and my, my dad was, you know, worked for a large uh, company. He was somebody who really believed in the free enterprise system. Who, um, what way did you, uh, to the age of 13, you lived in a tiny, tiny town in the northern tier of Alabama. Hmm. To, to this day, I can't pronounce the name, Tuscumbia, how's it pronounced? Well, we actually lived in Athens, Alabama. Athens. Yeah. But to this day, it has only about 8,000 people, as I recall. Yeah. From small town Alabama, you're a boy recovering from polio. Mm -hmm. How did those early years affect the way you do your job in this institution? Well, with regard to the, the, uh, the polio, it affected my left leg. I was a little bitty kid. I don't, I don't remember it. I was only two years old. Mm -hmm. But my mother was, we, we lived, fortunately, not too far from Warm Springs, which President Roosevelt had right. set up. Over in Georgia to deal with uh, uh, polio patients. And <clears throat> my dad was over fighting the Germans in World War II when I was uh, attacked with this disease. And my mother took me over to Warm Springs and learned the physical therapy regimen. And <clears throat> I later learned, did that three times a day for two years. And my first memory in life was the last visit to Warm Springs where they told me they thought I was going to have a normal childhood. And we stopped by a shoe store on the way home and bought a pair of low top shoes, which became kind of a symbol for being a normal little boy. Why do I tell you that story? I think <clears throat> it made a huge impression on me that if you work hard and just keep pushing, the chances are you can overcome difficulties. And uh, if I, I don't have many good qualities, but I think one of them is I'm pretty tenacious and uh, um, inclined to uh, not courtly, let... courtly and tough are the two adjectives <laughs> that come up that come up about you all the time. Well, I spend a lot of time with students, and I always tell them that in our country there are only two ways to fail: you can quit, or you can die. But this is a country of second opportunities. And we are, unless we lose it, and I do worry about that with this administration, unless we lose it, we are an opportunity society. And that doesn't mean you just get one opportunity. Everybody has failures. You, you get another opportunity and another. We're the land of second opportunities, too. And so, as I say, I, I don't have a lot of good qualities, but I think sort of not being defeated by life's inevitable setbacks, and we all have them, is something I try to you know, kind of roll with the punches on and keep on going. Senator, I would think, as a layman now, <clears throat> that being in the United States Senator, beautiful building, lots of staff scurrying about, I can see the appeal, but at the same time, in this day and age, constant fundraising, constant state of campaign, just worrying about your own vote back home would be a pretty big job. That's not enough for you. You're trying to round up 47 votes day in and day out. Why do you want the work? What is it about the leadership that appeals to you? I mean, I'm genuinely, what is it about the well, leadership the that appeals to you? Well, the founding corny, Peter, <clears throat> believe it or not, <clears throat> I can go home almost every night and prop my feet up and say to myself, well, you know, I really may have made a positive difference today on something that would be good for the country. And I know that sounds really corny, but I've met a lot of people in public service, both on the left and the right, and I think the reason people subject themselves to the battering ram <laughs> that we're confronted, the battering that we all are subjected to all the time is we really want to try to have a positive impact on the country. And I, that's what keeps me going. And fortunately, uh, my constituents have apparently felt good enough about my work to continue my service here for some time. You are now the longest serving United States Senator in the history of Kentucky. Senator, to get to help some place the way you think about your role in historical perspective, let me name a couple of names and ask you to compare your working style, your techniques with theirs. Minority and majority leader from 1953 to 1961, Democrat of Texas, Lyndon Baines Johnson. How do you think of your role as compared with the way Lyndon Johnson did it? I'm probably not the best judge of 
who I'm like, but let me just tell you, if I had to pick a leader that I have uh, observed while, I'm, while I was here, and of course I wasn't here during LBJ, the one whose management style uh, I think mine is the closest to is, uh, is George Mitchell. Really? Yeah. Not Bob Dole? Well, they all were good. I mean, you know, right. I, I always describe this leader job as, uh, you know, it's like, it's like you're, you're, you're thrust into the middle of a bunch of class president types. They all have sharp elbows. <laughs> That's what I said. Who would want the job? Yeah, they all have sharp elbows and big egos, and they think they could do the job better than you. But through some mysterious process, you've been elected to leader. And in the, the way the Senate operates, it's not a dictatorship. Um, it's somewhat akin to being a groundskeeper in a cemetery. Everybody's under you, but nobody's listening. Right, right, okay. <laughs> good, good, good. Uh, so George Mitchell, what, what was it? I thought George was, was very skillful on the floor, um, able to articulate his uh, points of view, and um, was, of course, very partisan. He, he had a lot to do with Bush 41 only having one term, right. but you hardly noticed it. You know, he was very skillful at the way he, he operated. It wasn't so. so much a matter of graciousness as of shrewdness, deftness? I think a combination of, of qualities that I thought were, you know, appropriate for this body. Right. Which is not to say that the others I've served with haven't been effective. They right. have been. I served with Bob Dole and Trent Lott and Bill Frist on my side and uh, Harry Reid and Tom Daschle and George Mitchell and even I caught the, um, the end of Bob Byrd's period as leader when I first got here. Right. They, they all were talented in one way or another, but you were asking me to sort of right. try to compare myself to others, which you like is very, to underplay the very, very hard to do. But I think the, the guy that I think I probably most like was probably Mitchell. Senator, every Republican candidate for president, and I will not ask your opinion, <laughs> I know you wouldn't offer it. Every Republican candidate for president has said that his first order of business would be to repeal Obamacare. I've looked into it a little bit as a layman and I'm not quite sure. So would it be as simple as introducing a piece of legislation that says the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act of 2010 is hereby in its entirety revoked? Can that, how would it work to repeal it? Well, I think that's a vote we ought to have. If it doesn't uh, pass, then the second step would be to repeal major parts of it. Can you, uh, if you don't mind, a little bit of a tutorial on the workings of the Senate. Uh, could you use the reconciliation process yeah. to repeal it? Could you get, could, a simple majority of 51 would do it? How? Yeah, we are getting down in the weeds a little bit. <clears throat> the, the, um, the, the reconciliation process, which you were talking about, won't do everything, but a, a significant portions of the bill probably are what we call reconcilable. And the reason that's important is because if it's reconcilable, you can do it with 51 votes, right. not 60. Now, the downside to that, Peter, is it's not permanent law. The reason the Bush tax cuts keep coming up is that we had to do them through the budget reconciliation process, which means you could do them for a period of time, but you couldn't make it permanent unless you could do permanent law, and that you would require 60. Now, best case scenario, if I'm the majority leader next time, if that happens, we're not going to be sitting on 60 votes. Right. So we would be looking at Obamacare, which we think, which I think, and I believe my colleagues think, is the single biggest mistake that's been made here by this country, certainly in my 25 years in the Senate, and try to see how much of it we could get off the books through the reconciliation process. And I think if we had a new Republican president, as you've indicated, they think that would be the number one priority. I agree with that. I know Speaker Boehner would agree with that. Uh, this was a gargantuan mistake for our country that needs to be undone before we've gone so far down that path that we can't call it. So to, to just again for the layman, if I say to you, Senator, can that darn thing be repealed? The working answer for a layman such as me is, yeah, we could do it. We think we could do most of it through the reconciliation process. I see. And there may be a way to get at, uh, we would be looking at trying to dismantle it in every way that we could. You'd do your best. 
Yeah, we do our best. And how much of it we could accomplish in terms of permanent law would depend on the voters of this, of this country. It depend on how many votes we had, how many Democrats we could entice uh, to join us. Uh, they weren't any of them the first time. But if you look at the survey data on Obamacare, it's extraordinarily unpopular, more unpopular today than the day the president signed it. Newt Gingrich has said, again, I'm not asking you to endorse or even comment on any candidate, but just as a matter of uh, sort of technical proceedings within this institution, Newt Gingrich has said that if he wins the Republican nomination, he will make it a central plank of his campaign through to Election Day in November that Congress should come back, the current Congress, as presently constituted, in special session and repeal Obamacare, and that the Democrat, there will be enough Democrats who would feel the heat at home that he thinks that could happen. Is that, does that strike you as within the realm of political possibility? That would be a dream come true. All right. And uh, we, we would certainly hope that might be possible. Right. Interview in the New York Times you gave late last year, mm -hmm. you cited major legislation that had been enacted during your years here with one party in the White House and the other in control up here on the Hill. And you, you mentioned in particular the 1986 tax reform under President Reagan, and then a decade later, the 1996 welfare reform under President Clinton. Although I note that the Republicans in this institution sent it to the White House three times before yeah. he signed it. And you said, I quote you, divided government is the perfect time to do big things. The perfect time, close quote. How come? Not only is it the perfect time to do it, some would argue it's the only time you can do it. And there are actually four examples that I always cite. <clears throat> the Social Security fix in 1983, before I got here, Reagan and Tip O'Neill did that, raising the Social Security age. Very toxic thing to do politically, but when they did it together, no toxicity at all. Comprehensive tax reform, and then under, Cl then under Clinton, welfare reform, and several years of balanced budgets done by a divided government. Why do I say that? Because <clears throat> Doing the kind of stuff that we need to do to begin to tackle a debt now as big as our economy is not popular. And <clears throat> much of the debt problem that we have is driven by entitlements, which are extraordinarily popular by everyone, Tea Party people, liberals, moderates, everybody. So the politics of it is so difficult that 2011 would have been the perfect time, and I had this discussion with the President of the United States on a number of occasions in 2011, the perfect time for the Republican House, a robust Republican minority in the Senate, and a Democrat in the White House to do the kinds of things that we know we need to do to save Medicare and Social Security. We could not get him to do it without a trillion dollar tax increase, which he knew darn good and well that even if Boehner and I had endorsed it, we couldn't pass it. So he set the crossbar so high and then started his campaign with bus tours in August of 2011. Um, in fact, you know, I basically haven't heard from him in six months. He decided to start the campaign and what they're doing in their, uh, what he's doing in his campaign for president is acting like he hadn't been there for four years. You're not gonna hear him talking about anything he did it's the camp the theme of the campaign is it's not my fault and so you've heard the various culprits it's the tsunami in japan it's the debt crisis in europe it's of course the republicans the congress the rich people it's wall street it's anybody but me is the reason we are where we are this is an incumbent running for re-election not even mentioning any of his major accomplishments why they're extremely unpopular. And so our nominee, whoever that person may be, in my judgment, in order to be successful, needs to make this a referendum on the last four years. You know, you've seen all of this. The president got everything he wanted for two long years, everything. In spite of our best efforts, we didn't have enough to stop him. How'd it work out? That's what the presidential election needs to be about, in my opinion. Senator, also late last year, you said, I quote you again, the single most important thing we want to achieve, we, the Republican conference in the Senate, is for President Obama to be a one-term president, close quote. All right, now tell me, as a layman, what it is that I'm to hope for. Divided government could give us a chance to get things done that need doing, 
On the other hand, the minority leader of the Senate said, let's get that man out of Pennsylvania Avenue. Well, I mean, that leaves out the rest of what I said at that time. <clears throat> okay. What I said was, obviously, the number one political objective of Republicans, certainly the Republican leader of the Senate, is to have a different president. But that's in 12. I said that in late 10. I went on to say divided government, as you and I just discussed, was the perfect time to do big, important things, and the election will be later. Well, I didn't think he was going to start the election in August of 2011. You know, typically, the president tries to be president for a while longer before the bus tours start. And he basically cut short what could have been and should have been an extraordinarily productive year of bipartisan accomplishment on the biggest issues confronting the country in 2011. We look back on 2011, except for the debt ceiling, uh, the, you know, the, the Budget Control Act, which wasn't good enough for some, but was better than nothing. It's hard to think of anything constructive that we did for the country. So we squandered the opportunity presented by divided government because you cannot accomplish things without presidential leadership. And the president was absolutely AWOL from August of 2011 up to the present AWOL. Senator, you've got, a, you've got an institution to run here. Well, last, last couple of questions. For a layman, again, uh, you feel free to treat me as an idiot child here. I, I, this is a question I'm asking without any idea what the real answer is. Genuine question, in other words. How are we to understand the United States Senate? I've got James Fallows, former Carter speechwriter, wrote in The Atlantic <laughs> that when the Senate was created, Virginia, the most populous state, had 10 times as many citizens as Delaware. Now we have California with 69 times as many people as Wyoming. The Senate is an embarrassing anachronism from the 18th century. Rick Hertzberg, also as it happens, a former Carter speechwriter, wrote in The New Yorker that, we, were, that, that uh, we may be stuck with, quote, our ungainly 18th century legislative mechanism, but there's one obstacle he named in particular, the arsenal of senatorial death rays that goes by the quaint name of filibuster, close quote. You've given a quarter of a century of your life to this institution. What is it that Americans should understand that the United States Senate, as opposed to the House, as opposed to the presidency, what is it that this peculiar institution does best and that no other institution in our constitutional arrangement can do? Well, what those critics you cited don't understand <clears throat> is what the founders had in mind for this country. The idea was not to concentrate power, but to divide it, to have checks and balances. In fact, Washington reputedly was asked when he was presiding over the Constitutional uh, Convention, what do you think the Senate's going to be like? And reportedly, he said, it's going to be like the saucer under the teacup. The tea is going to slosh out of the cup down to the saucer and cool off. In other words, the Senate was created on purpose to not do things quickly to not respond to the passions of the moment, to be a place where you think things over and, re and consider them. And what's developed over the 235 year history of the country is a set of rules on top of six year terms with only a third of the Senate up every, three, every two years. That was done on purpose to make sure the Senate was kind of the cooling off place. And then the rules over the years developed to require a supermajority. Now, what does all that say? It says that in the Senate, one of two things are going to happen in all likelihood. <clears throat> Either nothing's going to happen at all, which is what the founders were interested in seeing occur on a number of occasions, because they were concerned not about, you know, they didn't want to have a streamlined government. They wanted to have a lot of checks and balances. Or a bipartisan coming together such as we've seen on, at, at critical moments in our history, some of which in recent history we've talked about, the decision to raise the age for Social Security, the decision to have comprehensive tax reform, or to pass welfare reform. All of those done through a Senate designed to slow things down and to actually stop things. The way I look at the U.S. Senate <clears throat> over the history of the country, it's prevented an awful lot of bad things from happening. And if you start with a notion that government is the answer, then you've got a big problem with the Senate. 
if you start with a notion that most often government's probably the problem, then you love the United States Senate. And my guess is those critics you cite <clears throat> look for, would have preferred a kind of European parliamentary system. Rick Hertzberg you know. is explicit about that. He yeah. would prefer it, yes. Yeah, where, you know, Woodrow Wilson, for example, uh, thought the, uh, the founders had made a big mistake in making the Congress so powerful. He, he, he was a teacher, he was a political science teacher and university professor who, who was very similar to these critics. He thought this, this congressional meddling around and everything and not going along with uh, executive leadership was a huge mistake for the country. I don't share any of those views. <clears throat> I think the, uh, <clears throat> the fact that it's hard to do things in the Senate has been very good for the country. Final question. <clears throat> the Senate today, 53 Democrats, 47 Republicans. Now I know I can't get you to talk about presidential politics, but would you care to call the numbers post-election <laughs> no, day? No, I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Let me say this. I don't, think, <clears throat> I don't think either side is gonna have a codlock on the Senate after this election. You, no chance of 60 votes for no, our side. I don't think so. So it'll either be a Senate that tilts a little bit to the right or a Senate that tilts a little bit to the left. But to accomplish things in the Senate, given where we're likely to be after the election, is going to require the kind of compromises that some of our most aggressive supporters will not like because they, they hope to get the, the perfect out of a system that's designed to make passing the perfect pretty unusual. You know, the Democrats have had a few times where they've had huge majorities. Right. My party hadn't been over 55 in the Senate in 100 years. So the chances of us having the kind of position with a Republican in the White House, 60 votes in the Senate and a big majority in the House, that's not likely to happen. So I think we need to have realistic expectations about what's possible. I think we can save this country from further excess. We maybe can go back and revisit some of these horrendous mistakes that were made, the biggest one being Obamacare. Um, and that's, that's a goal worth uh, fighting for. Mitch McConnell, Minority Leader of the United States Senate and Kentucky's longest serving senator ever. What a pleasure. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Peter. For Uncommon Knowledge, I'm Peter Robinson. Mm -hmm.